These unusual transit systems, like this tiny elevator and the iconic monorail, were supposed to be the future of transit. So what happened to them? Well, I realized I'd never ridden on them. So that's what we're doing today, starting here in West Virginia for the Morgantown PRT, which stands for Personal Rapid Transit. So let's head upstairs and see what this is like. Now, I often come to these a little unprepared just so I can be surprised and enjoy it in the moment. But I didn't expect that I'd need quarters. It costs 50 cents, but it requires exact change, which I do not have. So we're going to town. Ah, not a problem. Quarters shouldn't be that difficult to find here downtown. We need a coffee shop or something. But... I can't find anything open, though. I guess I thought businesses would be open at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning downtown. Who knew it could be so difficult to ride public transit? But this has been the fun part of this trip. It's just getting to explore American cities and towns because of the public transit, that's interesting. It's a very cute town though. We'll find something. I don't know where we're gonna... Tacos instead of coffee? Yeah, let's get some change. Menarca Taqueria to the rescue. In the end, the best I could do was find a taco shop. I think this was the best way to get change. It was so good I had to get more. Wow. Thank you, bye, see ya. Great tacos, quarters. We're good to go, Monarco. Now, this is where I'm briefly confused. You see, it's old school requiring quarters, but at the same time, the turnstiles are modern with a touch screen. Oh, my bad, not a touch screen. So as you come in through the gates, you select your location, your destination. And these little automated pods will take us there. And now, I'll wait here on the platform till another PRT pulls up and this board will tell us which destination it's going to so I know which one to get on. It's an express door-to-door -door service, which means you put in which station you want to go to and it takes you direct to that station without stopping at the other stations along the way. I mean, honestly, it opened in 1975 and I can't imagine how futuristic that would have seemed at the time. This was the first system of its kind in America. And have you seen any other since? That's why I'm here to ride it today. Gate two is boarding for tower. That's good. Here we go. At first, it looks like just a very small metro car, or maybe more like an airport shuttle. But this isn't taking us to the next station on the line. It's actually taking us directly to the station that we selected when we went through the turnstile. So in that sense, it's actually more like an elevator than a metro. As you can see, it's not lightning speed fast either, but it's pretty efficient thanks to the elevated guideway here, but the best part is here. You see, the track splits. It goes to the right and up into the station while we're staying on the express track on the left and skipping the station altogether. It might not seem that cool or flashy, but this is what makes this whole system so unique. Now, I'll be honest, the rest of the Morgantown PRT isn't too impressive. The vehicles are small and only seat eight people. The ride is not very smooth. It is a little rough. It's on rubber tires after all. And it's not a very big system either. Only about three miles long with only five stations. The only reason I'm here is to do exactly this. Bypass a station. That's it. That's what makes the Morgantown PRT Cool. These moments don't happen on any other system. That is a cool system, but it is starting to rain in Morgantown here. So let's go somewhere that's a little bit sunnier today and go see our next futuristic transportation device. We're headed to St. Louis, which means we're headed back to the airport. Yes, another travel montage, but we'll keep this one short. In fact, let's just skip ahead. Now we've arrived in St. Louis. Another city I've never been to before. All right, we're leaving the airport, but we've all seen this before, so let's just cut ahead. We're arriving at the hotel. Oh, classic tap the door shot. And guess what? I'm gonna fall into bed for a transition. <sighs> oh, good morning. There it is. At, at least half of it. Let's go see it. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is the St. Louis Gateway Arch, the tallest arch in the world but it doesn't move. Now you're probably asking yourself, Michael, I thought this was an episode on futuristic transit. What are we doing at a tourist attraction? Well, 
it's one of the most impressive elevators in America. The Gateway Arch is a national historic landmark and the tallest memorial in the US. The building itself was a feat of engineering and stands as a memorial to American culture and civilization. But the most difficult part was figuring out how to get people to the top. You see, a normal elevator goes straight up and down. But this building is curved. So how do they figure that out? Well, one of the original ideas was to have two elevators. The first one goes straight up and down from the most inside point until the most outside point. It would get it about 300 feet in the air. But then you'd have to transfer to an angled elevator that would be much smaller and that would be a pinch point for guests waiting. Not a good idea. The next idea, which I think is pretty good, was more of a Ferris wheel, where the system was continuously looping fully underground and just keep rotating people through. In the end, it was thought that the Ferris wheel teetering seats would tempt too many daredevils, so they didn't go with it. So we're here to find out what system they did go with. This is slick. What I like is the Gateway Arch is a national park, which means this modern elevator is run by the National Park Service. Wow, this is an impressive museum. I didn't expect this. These are just the things you stumble upon when you come to see an elevator. Ah, if this is a model of the arch, they must have a model of the pods too. They went with a combination of the Ferris wheel and the elevator. So these rotate on their own joints and their own capsules, but they are pulled up and down like an elevator rather than a consisting rotating thing. But of course it's a, a little bit bigger. This is the builder's wall and Richard Bowser right there, he was the one that designed the elevator. No engineering degree, just a smart guy. Mm -hmm. All right, right down the ramp. Paul. Thank you. All the pod entries, very small doors. All right, let's go ride this thing. It's like getting into a space pod. I feel like I'm going to space. It's not very big. It seats uh, five. And I hope you're not claustrophobic. Because the construction and design of this elevator system was so impressive, they put windows in the door so you can watch your progress as you climb the arch. The glass windows are nice so you don't feel too claustrophobic. We're going vertical now. It's fun to think that these people in the pod with me have come to see the views from the top of the arch while I've come just to ride the pod. I mean, this elevator was as much a feat of engineering as the arch itself. And I feel like it doesn't get enough credit for that. In fact, some could say the view of the stairs out through these glass doors are ugly. But I think it's a good reminder that, well, we could be walking up the stairs had Rick Bowser not come up with this unique solution. And that's the whole point of why I'm bringing you along on these trips, because these are underappreciated. This elevator doesn't just go up and down like any other. It tilts and then lets go. And now we're starting to angle ourselves along the arch towards the top. Getting narrower now. There is no other elevator like it in the world. You get out onto a stairwell because it gets so narrow at the top of the arch that they couldn't fit the elevators up here. So by having the elevator stop there, they can have more viewing platform area. The views up top here really are worth it. I mean, I know we're in a giant arch, but the small windows kind of make it feel like we're looking out of a spacecraft or something. This is a good episode. If you're still here with me, that must mean you're waiting for the iconic monorail. All right, let's go to our next city. Off to the airport we go. We're here to ride the most futuristic of them all, the monorail. They say it's the fastest way to get from downtown Seattle to Seattle Center. Here we go. I don't know why I expected this to feel more futuristic as well. Which brings us to my first ride on the famous Seattle monorail. It's busier than I expected, but it's bright. Look at these huge windows. Oh, <laughs> love those sounds. Welcome to Seattle Center monorail. <sighs> All right. I'll be honest, this monorail doesn't look as futuristic as it once used to. It's rather ordinary. Maybe a little rougher than I thought. I mean, I guess it makes sense. It runs on rubber tires too, just like the Morgantown PRT. And in fact, it only has two stations, one at each end of this mile long track. So it's not a huge system either. 
Now, there are a few monorails around the United States, so it's not even a unique system like the first two in this episode. I have to admit, for being 60 years old, it's in pretty good shape. It might not be futuristic anymore, but it's still iconic. Transit is about getting people from A to B, and the monorail was a way to avoid traffic by being in the sky. But this whole series has shown transit designers often had to come up with creative solutions for unique problems. Like Amtrak, offering a train to get skiers to a nearby ski resort. Or in San Francisco, where the steep hills required cable cars to be built. And in some places where accessing mountains would be near impossible without aerial trams. Now whether or not they need to rotate is up for debate. And smaller hills created the funicular to get local citizens up and down on their daily commute. I'm glad I've chosen to come ride them. They might not be the most impressive systems in the world, but each of them has their charm and has contributed to the history of this country, even if they didn't end up being the future. And that is where it brings us, the Space Needle. All right, let's go check out the Space Needle. Like the monorail, the Seattle Space Needle was also built for the 1962 World's Fair, designed to look futuristic. That's what we're here to see. And it did, at the time. Time for the elevator, up over 500 feet. I mean, with glass elevators like this to take us up 520 feet to the observation deck. This is awesome. It's an experience few had seen at the time. Oops. Wow, thank you. Wow. Oh, this is worth it. Holy. So I hope, if anything, this series has inspired you to take notice and appreciate some of the unusual, underused, and even bizarre transportation wherever you are. <laughs> because they helped connect people with each other and bring us to some pretty neat places. Officially, we need more airports like this. I can't believe we're here on Mardi Gras! Like this rotating observation deck atop the Seattle Space Needle. I don't know where I'm going next, but I know I want you there with me. I'll see you next week. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this portion of the video, Surfshark VPN. And I'm going to use this very sad looking plant to help explain how a VPN can help you. You see, I travel quite a bit. And sometimes in certain countries, websites or certain streaming services have content blocked that I wanna watch. So I can use Surfshark VPN to remotely access one of their over 3000 servers in over 90 countries. And then I can connect through that country and access it like I normally would. Just like how this plant would rather be somewhere with more sunlight. So if it had a VPN, it would virtually move itself to another country and get more sun and live a happier life. And the best part about Surfshark VPN are its security features. You see, it encrypts everything between your device and the internet. So even if it gets intercepted by hackers, they wouldn't be able to read any of your personal information and your data is secure. And it works on all devices. It's better to be safe than sorry. And lucky for us, right now, if you click on the link in the description down below and use discount code DOWNY, you can get Surfshark VPN for 83% off and they'll throw in three months free. Thank you, Surfshark VPN, for making sure I'm secure wherever I go and for sponsoring this portion of the video.